And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to a straight, coming to a straight, straight from the from the land of from the land of terrible sports teams known as Cincinnati, and the, <laughs> a man who is a who is equal parts archaeologist and ga and gaming nerd, and the creator of the upcoming Heroes of Terra campaign setting for D and D fifth edition, the one and only Jacob Dirksen. Sorry, Dirksen. Hello. I got it right, and then I screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> How's it going? Thanks it for is, having me. It is going good. Um, I'm actually showing restraint. I was very tempted on making some sort of coup joke, and um, nothing, nothing ah. was coming to it, so I just decided to, I just decided to skip it. Um, well, I'll, I'll hand the sports team one to you. That was a fair shot. <laughs> I um, I have a, I have a, I have a um. I have a I have a friend who's unfortunately a Bengals fan. Oh dear, yeah. <laughs> and I I know he I know he is because every time every because every Sunday for half the year, um, he'll send he'll send me he'll send me a um a meme from the office going, no no doubt about it, I'm ready to get hurt again. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much the long and short of it. Though you know, still take any chance we can to look down on Browns fans. Yeah, but can you can you really do can you really do that these days? <laughs> no, nah, it's been a while since they've had a kid beaten up in their stadium, so we can't really keep going back to that one. So they haven't well, you, we haven't really had much ammo lately. <laughs> you can you can pick you can pick on Blue Jackets fans. Oh yeah, yeah. They are they are still the least successful franchise in the NHL. Fair and, enough. There we go. And they're probably going to get even worse since they're going to be losing at least one person to the expansion draft that is going on as I record this. Hmm. Uh, and here's where I'm going to start uh, exposing myself as a fraud, as we are actually uh, reaching the limit of my sports knowledge. Um. Ev I, here's here's the thing. First off, I've um, I've already I've already pissed off a bu a bunch of sports nerds because I said um, fantasy because I said fantasy football is D and D for people who don't want to admit it. Oh sure. <laughs> um, and while some people while some people will do will do just one will do just one thing and that's it, we are all we are all encompassing bunches of nerds and jackasses here in the monastery. Well, I feel well at home in that case. So we pick on the dice gods when they make you when they make people suffer and we pick on people's sports teams when they end up failing. Some, some <laughs> true opportunists. In, some just get in we we believe in equality. We pick on everyone equally. <laughs> I um, respect that. It's just that it's just that some people are it's just that some people are repeat offenders for one reason or another. Um like the Mets who we pick right. on every July 1st. Uh, you know, you always got to have classics. Mm -hmm. As far as why July first, um, Bobby Bonilla Day. They still oh, Bobby Bonilla, pay. yeah. They still Even I've heard of that one. Yeah, they still got to pay one point four million dollars to somebody who hasn't suited up in a decade. <laughs> <laughs> they have to keep paying until twenty thirty five. I wish I could get yeah. that kind of deal. Oh yeah, but that man pretty much won it. I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, I know you've you've kind of, you've kind of hinted at this with, on some parts of the Kickstarter page, but I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Hmm. Well, let's see. That was the somewhere over ten years ago, mm -hmm. and you know, it just kind of started off typically as you know a lot of people do. You're hanging out with friends, uh, getting drunk isn't doing it. You know, just uh, you're bored watching movies. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'll say, hey, you know what? I've been hearing about this D&D &D thing for a long time. Let's, you know, let's uh, actually try it out. So we get together. We don't know what the hell we're doing. Uh, we don't have any pieces. So at first we were using beer bottle caps and chess pieces. 
That's a rite of passage if I ever heard it. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we just kind of slowly work our way up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, eventually one of our buddies, he gets so into it that he renovates his basement, picks up uh, crafting minis as a hobby. Uh, and uh, the rest of us, we pick up books here and there over the years. And, you know, it just kind of has this uh, natural organic progression as, uh, you know, I'm sure the story goes for many home groups. And uh, it's been the same group for me for uh, well over a decade now. I'm very fortunate in that fact. As I understand it, the majority of gaming is actually uh, done online nowadays. And uh, so I feel extremely fortunate and privileged for having a in-person group that steady and that long. So, you know, we uh, bounce around a lot, try a lot of different systems. Uh, but, you know, D&D &D has always been the you know, the main tent pole, uh, started off with fourth edition, uh, mm -hmm. quickly kind of got over that, uh, fell back into 3.5, went to, from 3.5 to Pathfinder. Pathfinder was actually the system where I have, uh, run my longest campaign ever. I say I've been DD, &D, uh, I've been, uh, gaming for over 10 years, and, uh, most of that was actually occupied uh, at one point or another by one continuous campaign. I'm very proud to say that I had a campaign that ran for about 10 years, and uh, that was with Pathfinder uh, going off of their uh, Kingmaker module. Eventually just kind of went off the rails and grew into its own thing, but that's the campaign where I really kind of got my chops as a DM, and that's the thing. It's, I, it's always been as both a player and a DM. Our group has always kept up a pretty good musical chairs rotation of everybody taking a turn at being DM. Uh, we rarely even have just one campaign going at a time. We uh, get bored easily, so we got to keep up this crazy Byzantine rotation of you know, multiple different campaigns weaving in and out every month. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ridiculous sometimes. I don't even bother keeping track. I have, you know... <laughs> I have friends who keep spreadsheets on their laptops for that stuff. You never had, uh, you never had a box of index cards? <laughs> no, I just ask I just ask everybody else, "Hey, what are we playing tonight?" and they tell me sometimes that it's one of my games and I'm like, "Oh, shit, I better prep." <laughs> um The way you the way you said it, I just ha I just have this mental image of 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 the of you and of you and one of the other people at the table um reenacting re Pinky and the Brain. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how it went a lot of the time. Absolutely. What are we doing tonight, Ben? <laughs> you know, and they, exactly, it would be uh, unsurprisingly, oftentimes, very literally, trying to take over the world, mm -hmm. as far as their character motivations often go. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't try taking over the world personally. Way too much paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fun little fact about my gaming beginnings. My first attempt at running any campaign ever was another Celtic themed campaign. Uh, though, given, you know, any Baby Steps uh, first campaign from a baby DM, it was, of course, over ambitious, chaotic, and short lived. But uh, looking back on it, I can actually see a lot of. Uh, Kind of the uh, the kernel of inspiration that survived up to Heroes of Tara today. Mm. So this has always kind of been a project in the back of my mind, I suppose, ever since I very first started gaming. Yeah. Now that be that being said, um, were you, when it come when it comes to if I had, if I had to if I had to guess, since you mentioned a Celtic themed um, um, game. Yeah. For for whatever reason, my, my my mind immediately goes to things like Birthright and um, Calamar, and I'm I get the feeling it wasn't either of those. No, it was another. It was a kind of the same idea. Where actually, I was attempting to homebrew a direct translation of like you know real world mythology, geography, history, make an actual game setting out of the British Isles. Uh, same way I'm doing with just Ireland this time, though at the time. As I said, it was way too ambitious, where I was trying to just throw everything at the kitchen, you know, everything and the kitchen sink right at the wall and make it all stick. Uh, the map included not just Ireland, but the entirety of the British Isles. It included not just Gaelic culture, but Brythonic culture and Gaulish culture and just every kind of Celtic reference that I could shove in there, like even up to Arthurian legends. And it was... 
you know, absurd and expansive and really had no big direction. And, you know, as uh, given that it eventually kind of spun out and we just uh, moved on to other things after having made a few good memories that stick with the group to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, so coming back to Heroes of Tara, basically when I first thought about starting it, I was thinking, well, why don't I take a second swing at this old, you know, uh, Celtic campaign chestnut that I uh, have stowed away in the back of my brain. But this time, let's trim the fat. Let's take what I've learned in the decades since as a DM and, you know, just also generally growing as a person and a writer. Uh, and let's make it more efficient, a more clear and concise and direct vision uh, being that, you know, kind of making it less about this entire idea of just capital C Celtic culture and just narrowing down on Irish culture. Which is, in, in fact, a very distinct thing. You know, I mean, uh, Celtic is a very broad and messy term, actually, and uh, pretty inaccurate when you try to use it in a lot of contexts. But uh, I immediately found, as soon as I kind of zoomed in and uh, and focused on this one particular corner of uh, that subject, being Ireland, uh, everything started to fall into place much more easily. Yeah. Now, when it com when it com when it comes to that, with heroes of heroes of Tara being a being a very um a very I a very um Irish centric um setup. The one of the one of the big questions that I ha that I'm cu that I'm curious about is, for you, what what's the appeal when it comes to that particular region? Like, what about that? What about Ke what about Celtic and and just and just the um myth just the mythos of the British Isles, but but um the but Ireland specifically um drew you in. Well, it's a few th things. Uh, I mean, I come from that you know that the primary uh uh kind of I I have that typical taste that a lot of people do, especially if they find themselves in the D and D hobby, being you know fantasy of all kinds. Mm -hmm. I grew up as a hardcore uh, Lord of the Rings fan, still am to this day. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I uh, center a lot of my tastes and sensibilities on this uh, kind of what you might call classic fantasy. Uh, and so coming from that uh, as my starting point, you know, you start to want to explore and look around for, uh, you know, different things, different settings, different flavors. And uh, what you find here is this is not like, you know, medieval fantasy, uh, what I'm working with here in mythological Ireland. It's uh, prehistoric. It's Iron Age. It's pagan, you know, and uh, it's something that not a lot of people really know a lot about. So I suppose I was really interested in wanting to share something that not a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, introduce a lot of players to a whole new setting, a whole new sensibilities. Uh, they might think that because this uh, is based on European mythology and European culture, that it will be a lot like, you know, later Eurocentric medieval fantasy, a la Lord of the Rings and traditional D&D &D and so on. But that is in extremely not the case, actually. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny you kind of bring that up because... Um... Something about D and D that's been my whipping boy for twenty years is the, is the fact that it doesn't know whether to shit or get off the pot regarding the type of fantasy that it is. Like, it, oh yeah, it wants to be all things at all times. Yeah the pro the problem the problem is um when you try when you try and when you try and when you try and look through the weeds the things that it's trying to be about it's not really good at being that thing. Like say yeah. um because I'll use the obvious part with Lord of the with Lord of the Rings. Um, Absolutely. I mean, without Lord of the Rings, there would be no D and D, really, <laughs> as we know it, at least. Yeah. <laughs> N nice save. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> consider consider the fact that just the ab the ability to la to lay on hands the standard ab the standard ability for paladins for years would be would it would that alone, aside from all the other stuff that a paladin or a cleric could do. Would be enough for them to be king to be king of a country, in in um, 
Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's probably the most miraculous thing that Aragorn does in the entire trilogy is he pulls off a lay on hands. Mm-hmm. Um, when and when it comes to when it comes to some when it comes to some of the other things like say like say Moorcock, um, which is what which is where the whole law of chaos thing comes in. Although, they, right. Although um, for whatever reason, and I don't, I still to this day have not figured out when this happened. It um that alignment system became less of a cosmic less of a less of where you are in the cosmos kind of thing and more of a morality system which are, I'd argue is the reason why alignment has so many problems it's put it's been put in a position it was never built for right and I mean I feel like that we're kind of having a flip on that nowadays actually where the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater everybody recognizes that it's pretty shabby for determining an individual character's morality and so they want to do away with the whole thing entirely. But, I mean, you, you hit on its actual function right there. I feel like uh, alignment is still incredibly useful if you're uh, concerned with, like, the planescape and so yeah. on. Something like planescape or so. The, re- the big reason I bring up Moorcock in this case is if you look at his Eternal Champion meta series, <laughs> which Elric is a part of, there is right. a specific pantheon of for, that represents law. There is a specific pantheon that represents chaos. Both of them are assholes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely, the extremes of each side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd I'd liken it to, I'd liken it to the elves and the auditors from Discworld, who represent the worst aspects of chaos and order, um, specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And and humans are right in the right in the middle of that. Um, if I need to use a more weeb example, um the Messiah and Gaia cults in the Shin Megami Tensei games. Um, <laughs> which is often why the best ending is siding with neither of them. But and the and but the it's one of those things where though just those two alone are two very di- are two very different styles of fantasy. Lord of the Rings is high almost mi- almost mythic, especially since you're essentially reading the account, the account of a folktale, if you're reading the books. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and morality is a very fixed thing in yeah. in that universe. Yeah. And um and when it comes to more when it comes to people like Moorcock or Howard, that falls straight into the sword and sorcery style, which yeah, it, which um is com- which is on a completely different plane. Yeah, and then like Vancey and Magic System is coming in out of left field with like its own kind of sci-fi flair going on. Yeah, um, I've read I've read through my fair share of the Dying Earth books. Um, yep. The big pr- and Vance that particular Magic System has been a whipping boy simply because um, it do- it in those books uh, Magic is treated like this highly complex form of mathematics. Yeah, that's the re- yeah, and there are equations basically. Yeah, and that's the reason why it ha- why it has to be constantly studied in order to remember what exactly you're doing. The same way you'd have to look up the formula in order to under in order to understand some some parts of calculus or some parts mm-hmm. of al- some parts of algebra. And from um, what I understand, like in some way they are in fact living, maybe not necessarily self aware, but they have some kind of like a. Dy- dynamic or agency to themselves where uh, if you're not careful they can kind of turn around on you to a degree yes and um this was parodied in Pre- in one of Pratchett's books the color of magic specifically with the mm, character yeah. of Rince- uh, Rincewind he can't you he's a wizard with multiple z's don't ask me why it just is yep who um can't use magic because there's this one really really dangerous spell in his head that no other spell wants to be near Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, it, it, yeah. They kind of have a, a mind of their own, you might say. Yeah. Um. But when, but um, this do, this does bring this does bring me to. We were, we can't we kind of got we kind of got off track got off track because we were go we were going with um what the appeal is when it comes to <clears throat> when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to Irish myth in particular. Right, I was explaining kind of what started me on this whole path and everything, yeah, so, and so I, what inspired I, me. 
Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's okay. I, I followed you right off into those weeds. Yeah, no, it's, it's fun to talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, what I was expressing at the top there was kind of uh, uh, what I would like to uh, kind of communicate to the audience, generally what my thesis was in making uh, Heroes of Tara, being this whole, uh, you know, adaptation of genuine mythology, wanting to share this authentic experience of a real... Uh, source material with people mm -hmm. but uh personally as far as like my personal interest goes i mean i don't have any particular irish heritage i mean i have a probably a little bit i'm kind of your typical american you know like uh you know every which way kind of mix here mm -hmm. all over the place but uh uh, I would say uh, for me, like the music, you know, uh, if you ever if you've ever heard of the Pogues, oh, I love them absolutely. Oh man, uh, the Chieftains—they're more of a traditional band, and just everything in between, all sorts. I could just rattle them yeah. off. Uh, it's probably it's uh, it's just the music that I love. I keep on returning to it for you know invigoration and inspiration. Yeah. Uh, and. I also just happen to really be into history and mythology, obviously, or else I wouldn't have made this book. But they just kind of both came together where uh, the music that I loved would lead me back to the land of its origin, as I've become fond of saying. And uh, from there, you know, I just learned about the mythology and it started to be a question of, man, why the hell does nobody talk about this? This is so cool. Everybody talks about the Greek mythology and Norse mythology. Irish mythology deserves some time in the sun, as, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And when when it comes to when it comes to that, I will I will note that I um I have a I have a fondness for for um folk metal, which led me to, which led me down a rabbit hole. And, mm, yeah, and that's how I, that's how I'd end up coming up coming down to something like this. But um one thing that one thing that I had that I had seen that you that you did that I th I think is interesting is instead of instead of trying to go with oh this is this is a fantasy version of uh, this is a version of Ireland where the folk where the folklore is actually true which I've which I've seen some developers do um you inst you're instead creating you're instead creating a setting that's based on th that mythos but is but isn't isn't directly taking place in them that being um Eru. I'm hoping I got pronunciation right cuz I my Gaelic is horrible. <laughs> right. Well, uh it well actually it is uh you might say uh in one way certainly it is very much based in uh the actual island of Ireland. Uh if you mm -hmm. look at the appendix G in the back of the demo PDF, there's a map uh of Ireland itself. It's it's the setting Eru is uh, actually an ancient name for Ireland uh, in the Old Irish language. Uh, it was actually the name of a, a goddess, a member of the pantheon known as the Tua de Danann, and uh, the Gaels named the island after her. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eru actually then translated kind of, you know, into Ayr or Er, mm -hmm. and er, from Er you get Ireland. Uh, by the English, and that from there you get Ireland. Uh, so uh, this is actually, a, 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 you might say, in Ireland where the uh, folklore is true, but uh, it's perfectly reasonable why you might think otherwise, because this is uh, absolutely, in many ways, quite unfamiliar from what uh, people might expect of a historically accurate setting, you could say. Mm-hmm. It's 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 it is historically accurate in many ways in that you know I researched the archaeology to try and figure out exactly how the even the architecture and the households and the layouts of uh, forts would be you know uh, I've uh, done research on the history of the actual customs and habits and you know way of life of the actual ancient Gaelic people that lived around the turn of the first millennium uh, but then that's all just kind of you know table dressing and uh, the foundations over which is then laid the mythology. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's ever a conflict between mythology and history, I always err on the side of mythology. And it gets to be absolutely wild. It's not it's not totally historically accurate once the mythology gets to it. You know, that kind of turns things on its head. Abs absolutely. Uh, it's more mythologically accurate. Uh, 
<clears throat> and it's it's high ma it's actually quite high fantasy. You might expect it to be a low magic setting uh, when you hear historically accurate. And sure, the the, the people, uh, the characters, they dwell in you know reed thatched mud huts, but uh, they get up to some pretty wild, crazy, colorful stuff. A person who plays this game is not going to find themselves in any shortage of a. Uh, uh, you know, absolute madcap action. We even have a Planescape, The Otherworld, mm -hmm. Dungeon Delves, uh, quite a lot going on under the surface. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, since I, since I already, already made, already made fun of myself thoroughly when I, when I, when I said how terrible my, terrible my, um, Gaelic is, and give, given how, whenever you're dealing with dealing with the language of of um ancient of ancient British Isles, no matter which um island you're dealing with, oh absolutely, you're going to be dealing with characters that are going to be um unfamiliar. And when I say characters, I'm specifically referring to um let letters, not characters, as in player characters, um, right? That are going that are going to be unfamiliar and some and um. Some people will will um, have will have no idea how to tr how to try and pronounce, and that brings me to the question of: Did you provide a bit of a pronunciation guide? Oh yeah, I absolutely did. I I completely uh, saw this coming in many ways. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Gaelic is a real tongue twister. It's uh. I, I once looked into why it's spelled the way it is, mm -hmm. uh, because originally it, it was a you know it was it was a a completely oral language. It had no written text associated with it at first. It was only after Christianization that they adopted Latin text. And so you'd kind of think that when you're artificially grafting a writing system onto a pre-existing language, you could uh, <laughs> make it s as practical as you want. And I keep on wondering why they willfully spelled it the way they did and i wish i could remember the good reason for it there was once that i looked into it but i can't remember now mm -hmm. but in any case yes uh there will be a or and is currently in the demo pdf a uh pronunciation guide back there in the appendices uh goes through just i i managed to actually cram all of the basic essentials all onto one nice page there at the very front and then the, the you know the following pages thereafter are a few charts of uh, various phonemes and letters and consonants and so on. Even a a good selection of actual sample words in Gaelic uh, to give you a you know a little phonetic spelling of each of them as an example. So mm -hmm. uh, people who find themselves uh, a little overwhelmed by the uh, the language will not be without aid. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I will note that when when I when I mentioned the, um about about certain games doing the this pl this place and this place and time except the mythology is true, um the big mm. one the big one that was that I was invoking with that is the Tibet RPG, which um I was when I co when I covered that years ago I I was. I was sweating at the thought at the thought of that that I'm gonna get myself hounded for my bad pronunciation on that front. Right now, um, I must admit I've never actually heard of that one. I'm very intrigued if there is an RPG out there that covers Tibetan folklore and mythology. There, there is. Um, it's been it's been around for quite a few years. I'll I'll give I'll give you the details af afterwards. Um, Absolutely, yeah. No, that that sounds very intriguing. But since since you mentioned um, that this is leaning more towards high fantasy, given what I said about Lord of the Rings earlier, would you say that Heroes of Tara falls more into the category of mythic fantasy? Um, would you uh, qualify Lord of the Rings as mythic fantasy when you uh, bring that up, or uh, yes. is that as a... Yes, I would. It's very mythic in tone, but in terms of scale, it's, uh, let's say it's more Silmarillion than Lord of the Rings, if you get me. It's, get uh, definitely on kind of that elevated level where, uh, magic is certainly more tangible in many ways. The gods are, uh, much more directly, uh, you know, interacting and impactful on individuals' lives of mortals. 
Yeah. Uh, and heroes, especially the player characters, are absolutely larger than life. You that, know, like they. That's the key part. When yes. Comes, um, a lot of people, a lot of people have the idea that mi that mythic fantasy involves a lot, a lot of magic, a lot of supernatural presence. Not necessarily. Yes. But the key thing in order for it to be mythic compared to high is lar is larger than life characters. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I, actually, it should be said that uh, so fifth edition, which it, here's a tar is based in. Fifth, fifth edition already has a bit of a reputation for like a super powered characters, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I feel like three point five at the very least is a huge contender for that title as well. When you look at like the the feet bloat that that you can and all that three three point three point five is bo is both full of needles and can and can be che and can be cheesier than we than wheels of cheese at Oktoberfest. Absolutely, yeah. A power gamer can actually, I feel, go much farther in 3.5 than 5th edition, but whether never, we like it or not... Have you never heard of Pun Pun? I think I have, yes. <laughs> uh, so the the anecdote is actually not coming back to me, but that name is certainly ringing a bell. <laughs> that, was an, that was an attempt on the old Wizards forums by some madman to create a kobold character that breaks the game, and he did uh, so by exploiting a loophole to give himself potentially infinite levels in infinite classes. Why is it always kobolds? <laughs> Somehow it's always kobolds that break the game. It's these it, Pun Pun and Tucker's kobolds. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Those might be the only two examples coming to mind right now. Yeah. But, <laughs> but anyways, so yeah, whether it be accurate or not, 5th edition is currently bearing the reputation of being uh, the, the place for superpowered characters. You know, people call it, you know... Uh, the Marvel Universe kind of Avengers style gameplay where everybody's a superhero. Uh, people who have that uh, count that as a criticism against the uh, fifth edition, they might be kind of shocked and initially turned away from Heroes of Tara when they see what Heroes of Tara characters are capable of. Because mm -hmm. Heroes of Tara cap uh, characters are actually like you might say pound for pound or hit die for hit die, uh, whatever metric you want to put on it. Uh, probably uh, actually a little bit more beefy than uh, your typical 5th edition character. Uh, they certainly come with, packed with a few more features per level. Mm -hmm. But, uh, see, that's that's kind of leveled out by a few other uh, mitigating factors, some adjustments made out elsewhere in the game system that kind of level it all out, uh, such as the extended rest, rest times. Mm -hmm. uh, short rests are now 8 hours, long rests are now 7 days, a whole week. So in Heroes of Tara, yeah, after that first long rest, your character is out the gate. They're probably going to blow over that first uh, combat encounter. They're going to be big damn heroes standing astride the world, you know, counting their victories and uh, getting a big head. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, it becomes a bit of a matter of attrition, of uh, endurance. You know, if your long rest is seven days, well, you're here. Your characters, they got stuff to do. Uh, gone would be the days of a uh, player character party taking a long rest after every single uh, in battle encounter, which is honestly, I feel like maybe 90% of what leads to people having this impression of 5th edition being so easy or soft is the, uh, you know, it's, it's a common habit that I see many groups fall into is if they can get away with a long rest after every, after every single combat encounter, they will. Mm -hmm. And so, but things suddenly, uh, they, they get really kind of balanced out and very interesting when over the course of an entire week, your characters, they got to count their spell slots. They got to count that ability that only has two uses per long rest, etc. So it's uh, a, a very different scale of combat and uh, gameplay all together. Uh, you find your characters uh, start uh, approaching the world and uh, challenges very differently. They actually start role playing more. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, they start uh, kind of counting their days, counting their resources, uh, counting the, uh, the ways that they can get around other challenges instead of just going through combat in every which way. Though, of course, as these larger than life heroes. And the way the setting and the culture of the setting itself is set up, that is always an option. Because uh, if you know anything about ancient Irish mythology, uh, basically at every you know mountain pass or river crossing, there is some 
champion waiting to challenge you or something like that or you know just some beguilement or enchantment in the forest waiting to lead you astray it's it's all these sort of things that constantly come at the characters at a left field while they're uh engaging with these kind of earthly conflicts uh suddenly the other world just uh just just hits you upside the head uh <laughs> As soon as you said that, all I could think of was, none shall pass. Yep, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, get a lot of that, sure <laughs> enough. Um, mm -hmm. especially, especially, since you're de especially since you're dealing, you're still dealing with a highly, um, highly feudalist, highly, highly feudalistic society. So you're, get so you're going to have those territorial pissing matches. <laughs> right. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's more clan. I, I would actually say the, uh, the, uh, the structure of the society society would say is kind of the, the foundation is the, is the clan, the the kinship, in the tribe, rather than a uh, feudalism. Though of course you still have a lot of the same language. You have kings and uh, oaths of fealty sworn to those kings, mm -hmm. but more often than not, they're more accurately referred to as chieftains. And uh, your knights are warriors, if you uh, catch my distinction here. Mm -hmm. Um. And with it, we may as well get we may as well get into that since we've since we've kind of we've kind of danced around it. Um, yeah. When it come when it comes to when it comes to somebody who's let's let's go with a hypothetical of somebody who's been around the block when it comes to D and D's particular brand of um, fantasy. Um, right. What in what in particular with with um he, with Eru. Would would be it would be of an would be a bit of an adjustment period compared to compared to some of the trappings in D and D's approach. And I I asked this previously with the with the team behind um, Beowulf and got some interesting answers. Well, here's a a big adjustment, perhaps in both the way of uh, kind of imagining uh, the world and how you approach it, and also a way of playing the game. Uh, it, it requires a big adjustment, is the economy. Uh, you know, almost everybody is so you know, used to everything being kind of coin-based. You know, copper, silver, gold, put it all in your pouch or a po your pocket and mm -hmm. go on down the road. Don't need to think about it. Nice and portable. This is a coinless barter economy where the <laughs> economic standard is set by cattle. <laughs> so... Uh, there are no coins, uh, aside from, uh, what coinage is brought to Iru uh, from other lands as treasure, mm -hmm. but in that case, it's not necessarily valuable as currency in and of itself. It's only as valuable as the material it's made from. Uh, everything is, uh, kind of appraised and counted together from your material assets, especially your livestock and your cattle. Like, uh, player characters will actually be keeping track of, like, their herds back home. <laughs> uh, and obviously this leads to some questions like, well, how am I going to travel around with a herd of cows? Do I use the cows as literal currency? And it's like, well, it's not just the cows. See, uh, there are these uh, judges named Brehans. They're actually also a subclass that the characters can play, but that's another thing entirely. And uh, some, one of the services to society that they've done is they have gone around Iru, and they have appraised every single, every single conceivable item or piece of treasure, and they have assigned a, uh, like, just objective uh, value to it uh, in a abstract value set, in a uh, abstract unit uh, referred to a set that is actually based off of the cow. And so you kind of, I have this whole chart in the player's guide, lays it all out, lists just about every conceivable item that might be come across within the setting, provides you with its value in set, and if, so if your character has that in its possession, you just refer to that, take its value, tally it all together. Okay, fair enough. But then how do I travel with this? How do I trade with it? This sounds really cumbersome and inconvenient and troublesome, I know. But it actually, after you get used to the idea, uh really starts to encourage a really novel way of approaching the not only the mechanics but 
thereby also the game world. And it starts kind of organically feeding into roleplay. And before the players know it, by simply learning the rules, they actually find themselves getting deeper into the character, which is, I think, a big beauty of this uh, game in many aspects, is you find many of these mechanics, once the players actually get used to them, do they find that they kind of intuitively provide these handrails that just naturally guide you through the steps of almost like a simulation of uh, interacting with this setting. Uh, so, obviously I'm not going to go through answering like uh, the nitty gritty questions of like, well, how do you trade with cows? There's like a whole section in the book that uh, explains like, oh, well, you know, debt is accepted or you can you know, pay on delivery, or there are certain customs for getting around these questions. Yeah. And it all just comes back to that question of role-playing your character. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I would say economy would be a big one that a lot of people have already raised their eyebrows at. Yeah. And given given what you've talked about when it comes to the setting and how, and how it treats um, player characters, would it, be, would it be fair to say that the whole, that um, that where, that where you that where you come from where you come from is is significantly more important. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and well, it's it is, and at the same time, well, everybody lives very close alongside one another in uh, Iru. Uh, the society of Iru is actually kind of a, a, a it has a. a this is authentically going off of the culture at the time. It is a, a bit of a caste-based society, actually as distinct from like later feudal society. A lot of people have actually academically made comparisons to uh, the Vedic period of uh, the early Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. uh, Druids being equivalent to Brahmins, for example, which is very intriguing. But uh, so... The backgrounds, for example, all uh, we have nine backgrounds, and each of them relate directly to uh, one of these uh, social uh, levels of social status that your character might come from. Mm -hmm. But uh, even aside from that, uh, you know, you might say the Y axis of your social caste. You also then have the X axis of uh, the clan that your uh, your character is uh, descended from and a member of. Uh, which matters quite a bit. I don't necessarily have any strict mechanics very deeply associated with uh, clan, I like for such as like you know, for example, relationships or reputation or whatnot. But I provide an expansive uh, explanation of what clans are, what they mean to the culture, uh, how they work and interact with one another. I have an expansive list of names of the various clans that could be found. I encourage characters uh, to create and come up with their own. For their characters and provide them ways to you know name them for themselves etc but basically what this all comes to is uh help it helps you root your character in the world uh it is very difficult for a character in heroes of tara to just be this murder hobo without an identity or a family really um it's it's uh it's, again, uh, one of these examples that I keep hearkening to of how uh, as you kind of go through the motions of the mechanics and you uh, fill in your character uh, information and whatnot, it uh, very tangibly and immediately relates you to uh, a role and a relationship with the world and the setting. Uh, it's like, for instance, in... Uh, I said earlier that uh, for basic D and D, like I suppose the distinction I'm trying to get at, what makes Heroes of Tara special, mm -hmm. and what would uh, I would say is like the big selling point to anyone who is at all interested in this setting, would be earlier. I, I when we were talking about D and D, I say how uh, you know D and D wants to be all things at all times. Mm -hmm. It wants to have the broadest possible appeal, and it wants to uh, be as flexible as possible to allow people to make of it what they will with their own imaginations. And that's great. That That's absolutely fine, you know? Uh, it's a wonderful thing that, I mean, look, obviously here is Tara grew out of that melting pot sort of approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but for people who maybe want something of a bit more of a intimate, grounded, uh, and when I say grounded, I don't mean in terms of fantasy, as I say it's high fantasy, but grounded in terms of character experience and your relationship with the setting. This is uh, far more 
rich and intuitive in many ways. Uh, like for basic five, fifth edition, mm -hmm. a paladin or a rogue can be or can be anybody. It can be a a, a a court spy. It can be a thief in the street. Uh, it can be uh, a tr you know just a, a wandering troubadour who doesn't who just happened to not you know uh, choose the bard class. Uh, but in Heroes of Tara, for example, we have the Fenid. And a Fenid is a very particular identity with a very particular uh, role and uh, actual expectations of loyalties laid upon that class uh, in the game world. Uh, as a, as a, opposed to like a 5th edition rogue who uh, is just like this blank slate that can be anybody in any walk of life. Mm -hmm. Offended, uh, you know, obviously their background, as I said, determines the cast that they come from. But uh, once you your character enters into having class levels, the role of that class kind of supersedes anything that came before. And uh, like I say, uh, Fenids, they are servants of the High King. They serve in the court of the uh, Sacred Hill of Tara, which is basically like the, the Camelot of uh, Iru, you might say. It's kind of the it's the seat of the High King where all the heroes come together to hang out. And the High King's personal servants are these, uh, is this war band known as the Fianna. And each warrior that serves in the Fianna is known as a Fenid. Mm -hmm. And so a player who plays the Fenid, they have, they, they have these, uh, they, they are kind of given this very particular uh, uh, set of cues as to like, okay, here's who your character is. Here's what they are about. Here is what you mean to the setting and what the setting means to you. And I know in many other uh, games that might seem constricting, especially to a character, to a player who comes to a table expecting one of these free form, anything goes wide, expansive, gonzo fifth edition games. They might say, hey, don't hamper my creativity, man. What if my Fenid is, you know, uh, a heartfelt, sensitive uh, thief with a heart of gold, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, he can also be that because. There's a lot of reading in between the lines, and obviously as larger-than-life characters, I mean, there's precedent in the mythology itself. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, transgress transgressing of boundaries and characters going out to find their own and uh, their own motivations and, you know, uh, navigating these uh, loyalties and obligations and uh, struggling with them and uh, mm -hmm. maybe dedicating themselves to them if that's what they see is right. But uh, the choice to follow through with uh, what they're provided is there for the players to make. But either way, it's it's an experience that immediately grounds you in the in the setting, kind of sets you off running because that's what players need in this setting. It's, it's an unfamiliar setting. Not a lot of people know it. One of the useful things about so many of these well-worn tropes and uh, motifs and uh, conventions that we've become so used to in basic D&D is that players can often just kind of fall right into them as soon as they detect the the uh, signals of a well known plot beat. Well, it's it's pretty easy to kind of intuit and get yourself into there. But there are not so many easy points of reference in this setting. So I feel those uh, spaces kind of needed to be given a bit more support. You know, given a, a bit more structure for the players to. Uh, easily inhabit the world without needing to uh, really, you know, uh, do too much of their own research outside of this book. I wanted to have everything right here in the book for a, a, a player to do what they needed to do. Excuse me if I went on there for a while. No, wor no worries, man. Um, that's ki that's kind of what we do. That's kind of what we do here. Um, now, given, now, given that, given how, given how, um, since it is very cast leaning, um, I could e one one argument I could easily see being made, and it's not it's not one that it's not one that I would be making personally, but ju but just mm -hmm. but Justin is how is on um, what is the kind of is the kind of things that would that would drive somebody to leave the, to leave their um, to leave their established home leave their established home their established community. And take and take on the role of an adventurer. Um, Absolutely, because it's because whenever you whenever you've got that sort that sort of um, rigid defined structure, um, adventurers, no matter what form they're taking, are kind of outside of that structure. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and that's 
it's it's kind of a well it's an interesting thing where there is this cast structure and in many ways it is yes in a, in a ceremonial uh legal uh or criminal sense it is uh very strict in many ways very rigid but uh this is also you have to uh, understand a uh, society that is not uh let's say i don't want to say developed that's a bit of a chauvinist term you might say uh because it is in fact a very uh complex uh society and sophisticated society in many ways but it lacks many of the technical uh, progresses and uh, comforts that were enjoyed at that very same time by, say, the neighboring Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And in the Roman Empire, you have a society that is uh, productive and populous enough that they can actually output a level of production to support an incredible level of uh, class inequality, you know, between the peasants and or the Indians and the senators and such. Uh, but then in back in Iru, while you do have this caste system, it's really only relevant in like this uh, the the realm of the formal, you know, these these legal contexts where it, it gets pulled out and dusted off like the good China, mm. you might say, during ceremonies and feasts and all that and legal proceedings and all that sort of thing. But, uh, and this is not just, you know, me kind of uh, explaining to you behind the scenes. Uh, keep in mind, this is all laid out right there in the book for the players to uh, make use of as well. Uh, during day-to-day -day life, these people, they live right alongside one another. You know, mm -hmm. chieftains, you know, they, they share the same bath water uh, as, you know, their servants. Uh, and oftentimes there is kinship between them. These people, all they they all belong to the same clans. A uh, chieftain might very well be uh, have direct ties of relation to their some of their quote unquote common born subjects. Mm -hmm. So uh, social division is not really so much of a thing, and uh, nobody is necessarily a serf. There is slavery in the setting. I mean, there is no getting around that if I want to claim to be uh, historically researched and authentic. But mm -hmm. that is addressed in very mu much its uh, own topic in the book, and is uh, it's it's there for players to make use of as much or as little as they desire. Mm -hmm. It is not even necessarily a mechanic of the game, but be that as it may, uh, the the big element that really shakes things up for the character's call to adventure, really that impetus of uh, why a character would become an adventurer and take off on the road is the element of the other world. I mean, if you look at the the main mythology, the primary sources, mm -hmm. the other world is very much this literal alternate uh, plane, this, this other level of existence that uh, is incredibly entwined with the material mortal world. <clears throat> Excuse me, mortal world. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it inspires just about all of the advan adventure and drama and uh, magic that you see in the original mythology, and that's going to be the exact same case here in Here's Atara. Mm -hmm. The other world comes up in just about everything, uh, be it the character mechanics, uh, adventure hooks, obviously, uh, simply uh, descriptions of the setting itself and just about any unanticipated angle of a lifestyle or necessity it's uh it it, it it it's universal appropriately enough mm -hmm. now give now um given given the given the emphasis the emphases that you have with it within within this particular setup um when it obviously not all um not all settings are created equal Right and while 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 I'd be while I'd be hesitant to I'd be hesitant to give hard nose to certain players, um, are there in, are there are there any of the base classes that you'd that um you would that you would say would have a trickier time fit fitting in with it within the um within the established set setup that you have for Heroes of Tara. Any characters that would have a hard time fitting into heroes um, of tara 
I'm specifically referring to the char the base character classes in this sense. Uh, from from actual fifth edition, like yes. fighters and warlocks and such. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, if a player wanted to bring in uh one of the core classes into Heroes of Tara. They would have a bit of an uphill battle, I would say. Uh, they would actually find themselves, uh, I, I, I feel, quite severely outbalanced uh, by the Heroes of Tara classes. Uh, this was uh, designed with the intent that it be a bit of a self-contained system. Obviously, players are going to do what players do, and they're going to, uh, you know, adapt and, you know, uh, uh, you know co-opt and take what they can and, you know, mix and match and cherry pick and... I invite them to do so and experiment to their heart's content. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, mechanically speaking, it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle for any player bringing a base class into Heroes of Tara. Uh, thematically, I don't think it would necessarily be so difficult uh, to, you know, reflavor a character just to, uh, you know, explain that their powers are derived from any such otherworldly influence. Uh, you can honestly be as strict as or permissive as you want with the uh, the rules of the uh, the settings, magic, and so on, so mm -hmm. to speak. So there, that's not really so much of a con as much of a concern as the mechanical balance would be. Yeah. Now, even even with even with that, um, within the preview, you introduced three cl three um, new three new classes along with three um, subclasses for each of them. Yep. I'd like to, I'd like to go over the I'd like to go over those and what their what their particular niche is regarding what they um bring to the table. Certainly. Um so I'll start I'll start at the I'll start at the top with the Feynid. I'm pr and feel free to correct my pronunciation at any time. No, you got that pretty well. Oh. So what so um what would what would that particular class bring to the table? So the Feynid is a uh... Now, it is actually going to be quite useful for me to kind of fall back on, uh, you might say, parallels uh, in, in the basic 5th edition, mm -hmm. just for easy reference. So the Fainted is a, kind of a halfway between a ranger and a rogue, very much a martial type character, but also uh, very uh, utility and support focused. They, uh, Their primary stats are... And dexterity and charisma, and they are highly focused on mobility. Their uh, their base uh, core class mechanics. And once you really get into them, by uh, I believe level four, uh, you get uh, this feature called the stick test, and the stick test is kind of the core tent pole uh, quality of uh, the fainted that actually later uh, class features actually even build on top of. And what it does is it gives them this uh, special dash action that is not technically a dash action, but uh, suffice to say, it's uh, it gives them incredible mobility, agility, and ability to navigate a battlefield within the space of one round and uh, deliver uh, a, a an amount of actions that uh, a player would not necessarily see from any base uh base class not even a you know a, a high level fighter with action surge mm -hmm. uh so very very agile uh, if you want to think of them flavor wise as a ranger that would be most appropriate as they are also highly focused on wilderness uh navigation they are very much uh these kind of uh, uh kind of rough and ready outcasts of the wilderness and the wilds who kind of live on the fringes of society uh, but they're that also uh, brings this interesting dimension to them in roleplay sense, where, as I re was referring to them earlier, earlier they're also these uh, servants of the High King himself. They're kind of these actual rangers, these agents who go out into the wilderness and out onto the highways to carry out the High King's, uh, uh, you know, uh, will and such. Mm -hmm. And. When it comes to the sub, when it comes to these subclasses that they have, the fairy rover, huntmaster, and warrior poet, um, what w what would the ma what would you describe their major themes being? Well, uh, I think actually I should uh, I should uh, say that uh, the Fainted 
as well as the Warrior of the Red Branch, I, uh, which we'll be getting to later, obviously, were uh, based off of a archetype inspired by a very specific warrior or hero from Irish mythology. Uh, in the case of the Fennet, it is uh, Finn McCool, mm -hmm. uh, who is kind of the main character, the hero of the group of Irish mythological stories called the Fennian Cycle. And uh, Finn McCool uh, basically just kind of provided the uh, the the template for the Fennid, and all of the subclasses are basically kind of like aspects or dimensions of his character uh, of uh, the Finn McCool. Because uh, first off, you have this Fay Rover, who is very in, in close relationship with the other world. Uh, they are scouts of the wilderness that uh, go out far into the deep woods. And of course, in these fairy tales and myths and folklores, the deeper you go into the woods, the closer you get to the source of the otherworldly. The closer you come to interacting with that veil and piercing the veil and eventually going out through the other side until you find yourself in another land entirely. And that's what these uh, Fey Rovers have done. They've navigated these uh, strange, hidden pathways that n are unknown to many other mortals. And they have learned the secrets of the deep forests and the magic that uh, waits there. And they have traversed even the veil between worlds itself by following these uh, secret paths. And they've returned from these journeys, uh, having learned a few tricks. So... Uh, Usually the Fennid, a uh, base class, and the other two subclasses are, they don't have any spell casting. They're purely martial. Mm -hmm. uh, but with this subclass, they, you, get a, you, know, you get a spell list, you get spell slots per level, and a lot of other uh, abilities that turn you into this magical trickster, this ar arcane trickster in many ways. You set up illusions, you, uh, you know, uh, almost with a, with a bit of a druid-like flair, can uh, interact and uh, conjure the uh, elements of nature to help you out in a battle. And you can turn away otherworldly creatures uh, it, it just, you know, with abjurations and uh, forbidding words and incantations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then getting on to the others, we have the Huntmaster, who uh, is, uh, as it says on the tin, very much just like this uh, expert hunter, this deadly stalker who, uh, uh, you know, pursues their quarry. And uh, they their primary feature is uh, they gain sneak attacks and they have the companionship of a, uh, of a hound or more, should they wish to invest in that. Mm -hmm. And they are basically just the high-end de damage dealers, assassin characters, you might say. Uh, but very much with kind of like more of this uh, wilderness hunting kind of uh, theme to it, basically. Uh, and then finally, we have the warrior poet who actually is very, in many ways, kind of separate from the other two because he's still very much this agile warrior. Uh, but he's also making much more use of his um, charisma score. He's a lot more like the uh, the battle master, you might say, or uh, other such uh uh, buff-centric uh, martial classes that rally their allies and debuff their enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, just can always be found at the thick of battle. Uh, so that's that's defended uh, with these three subclasses of the Fairy, fairy Rover, uh, Huntsmaster, and the Warrior Poet. Uh, very much uh, a, a well-rounded uh, traveler of the wilderness, as well as uh, an eloquent uh, user of a uh, charisma and uh, trickery to mm -hmm. basically navigate the battlefield with all sorts of mobility. All right. Um, next would be the Filil. Yeah. So that's uh, what we got there is basically that's the core spellcaster. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, it's a seer. It's a, it, it It's, uh, forgive me trying to find the words here, get a good pitch going, I suppose. Uh, well, they're the learned cast. Uh, they are the, the ones that are basically uh, the, the keepers of knowledge, the stewards of learning. Uh, this is an illiterate culture, right? So there's uh, no written records. Uh, these these uh, 
these people, the Feely, are the teachers, the scholars, the priests, the singers, the historians, the the doctors, physicians, all of it. And uh, they uh, are, through their knowledge, granted visions from the gods. Because in this setting, knowledge is not just like this abstract uh, thing that is born from the mind. It's not just an abstract concept. It is uh, an aspect of nature. It's an actual universal force, knowledge, that can be uh, perceived and tapped into. Uh, almost like, kind of like, you know, you if you want to think of it as like the force or something, that almost seems to be the way that uh, ancient Celtic peoples conceived of it, and that's how I'm trying to express it here in the uh, setting. And it's uh, from this interaction with this element of knowledge that actually uh, derives the... Uh, function of magic within this setting uh, much like wizards in the uh, base uh, game and how their magic works uh, Feely basically learn their magic through study, memorization, and incantation mm -hmm. and they have the subclasses uh, two of which are going to be sound very familiar in their names obviously are the bard, the brehan, and the druid the bard is uh, very much in many ways what you might expect they are these performers, but more than like these, you know, uh, troubadours uh, that you find in basic D and D that are just kind of you know wandering around without a care in the world, just trying to romance everything and whatnot. Uh, a bard in this setting is something very different. Uh, they are the historians of this culture. They keep the stories alive. They uh, inspire people with their narratives and their songs. And they motivate people with the promise of uh, eternal glory and immortality in the stories and songs they tell. And uh, they are the primary like uh, uh, support, buffers. Uh, and I should say also, uh, Feely don't get spellcasting until third level. Uh, they uh, have cantrips up until then. I should say they also get a few other uh class qualities that make things a little bit interesting, obviously. Mm. Uh, but uh, spell lists are actually uh, determined by your subclass choice. So bards, brehans, and druids each get a separate spell list. And uh, getting on to brehans, they operate very much like clerics in uh, Basic 5th Edition. Uh, they are the law keepers, they've memorized the oral traditions of uh, the laws of the land, and they travel from community to community offering their services as judges and arbiters and uh, just uh, you know, quarrel settlers and such. And uh, they are provided some, uh, some ways to become uh, much more beefy uh, than your typical uh, feely spellcaster. Normally they only have a, a hit die of a d8. But the Brehan, they get, they get, uh, they are, they're able to pick up a shield and uh, get in there just like a cleric in many ways. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have the Druid, uh, similar in many ways to the basic Druid, but also uh, adopting very much the role of the wizard as like kind of the master spellcaster in a way. They don't necessarily have uh, much in the way of support. But they have a great deal of utility in their nature-based spell list, etc. And they also have access to a wide variety of special ceremonies and rituals that allow them to create these uh, special tools and items. Uh, and uh, obviously, we all kind of know the, the trope of what a druid is like. And uh, if they bring that to this table, uh, they that wouldn't be too far from the mark. Obviously, the book offers players a lot of opportunities to learn how these druids, as well as the bards and everything else that might sound familiar, is different from uh, what you get in basic D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot, you know, very unique and special about these druids. But if a player just wants to make their assumptions about a druid being a druid as they know them from their old games, that'd be just fine. Yeah. And finally, there's Warrior of the Red Branch. Big barbarian fighter bruiser. Uh, basically just uh, uh, the uh, the glory-seeking warrior out for a good fight and renown. Uh, the beefiest uh, of the hit die who can take a beating and give it back. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they have a rage mechanic, not unlike the Barbarian, uh, though it is somewhat different in many ways. Uh, they are, as the Fennid was based off of Finn McCool, the Warrior of the Red Branch is based off of Cuchulain, uh, who is also one of these big seminal heroes of uh, Irish mythology. And uh, just as the subclasses of the Fennid were based off of these aspects of Finn McCool, there are these other aspects of Cahollan himself that have inspired the subclasses of Warrior of the Red Branch. Mm -hmm. So we have the Chariot Chieftain, uh, which is very much like a cavalier, only instead of just a mount, you get a chariot to stand astride and uh, just plunge into the thick of battle upon, commanding the battlefield with your commanding presence mm -hmm. from atop this platform, uh, moving about with high mob bit mobility here and there, just to, like, thunderous prestige. Uh, then we have, uh, the, uh, Blessed Champion, who is very much kind of the paladin. They have attracted the attention and the favor of the gods, and the gods have blessed them with these boons, and you get such things as special weapon enchantments, a smite attack, just like a paladin, uh, an aura that activates when you activate your barbarian-like rage ability, that, uh, also extends buffs your uh, neighboring allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, we have the student of Skatha, who uh, has gone off to uh, learn at the feet of the greatest warrior woman in the known world, and uh, who runs a, uh, a, uh, a warrior school, an academy off on the, uh, up in the Hebrides Isles off the coast of Scotland. And uh, at this place, the students of Scothuk have learned uh, to basically hone themselves into these deadly uh, weapons. They're basically kind of like the martial artists or the monks mm -hmm. of the uh, setting, you might say, which brings a really interesting kind of layer to what is otherwise a very blunt instrument of this fighter barbarian. The student of Scothuk suddenly kind of hones them into this very precise and deadly edge in many ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've just gone through uh, describing all of the uh, classes and subclasses there uh, a little exhaustively in some points other than others. Apologies mm -hmm. if, again, I kind of lost the thread and rambled on a bit here and there. No, but I would just no, like... don't worry about that. We, um, we, pl we, plan to, we plan to have no plan here in the monastery. Fair enough. Uh, I would just like to cap off all of those descriptions there by saying that one of the other special elements that makes Heroes of Tara quite unique is that every single one of these classes is, uh, their mechanics are uh, governed and determined in many ways by a point management system. Mm -hmm. uh, initially inspired by, you know, like uh, from Basic 5e, the sorcery points of the sorcerers or the key points of the monk. Uh, mm -hmm. You have these point resources for each of the classes. For the Fended, it's cunning points. For the Feely, it's invocation points. For the Warrior of the Red Branch, it's glory points. And they each have their different ways of uh, gathering and scoring these points by, you know, and is by these ways that uh, players are kind of naturally or intuitively inspired towards uh, different play styles that are designed to suit the character's roles and such. And uh, by gathering these points, you are able to then spend them on various special ab abilities. As I said, these classes come quite densely packed with a lot of features. And uh, most of these features, especially in the subclasses, require the expenditure of these points in order to be activated. So uh, it's always kind of this dynamic balancing act of, uh, you know, making sure that you have enough resources on hand to get what you need done. It always adds a, a, a nice little, uh, uh, you know, a secondary element, another layer to the gameplay that, I, uh, that a lot of people really seem to enjoy. Just kind of making those numbers tick, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, with the with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, the next thing, that, the next thing that I was curious about ask about asking, is, I found I found something kind of interesting regarding regarding feats, um, with several feats that you've that you've added, each of them has an associated title. Um, what was the reason for do, for putting that into your into the system? Uh. It was uh, kind of brought about by a uh, popular demand, you might say. It was an idea that was uh, suggested and floated out there uh, among the community uh, relatively recently in the playtesting process. And uh, it, it 
gathered some acclaim. And I feel that the uh, reason for that was uh, it just seems kind of terribly appropriate for the setting. You know, this is one of those uh, settings where the reputation of the warrior is everything, and uh, your character is kind of expected to hold forth very loudly and frequently about their uh, their titles and their achievements and their glory and so on. Uh, and so just having this opportunity to kind of collect these titles, uh, it, it just kind of seems like a... a yeah, you know, just one of those fun little things that uh, you know, might not be ultimately of much consequence to the gameplay, but still, just kind of gives the players this uh, a, a small little reward here and there for making choices with their character. You know, mm -hmm. a little bit of flavor. All right, I get, I got you. Um, something else that I, something else that I've, I felt I, I felt that I want, that I wanted to delve into since. This is since one of these is something that isn't delved into all that all that often, even though it should be. Um, hmm. And the other one is something that's going to be unique to this kind of setting. Mm -hmm. I'll start, so, and, so I'd like to I'd like to go over a bit on um, Gyasa and feats. Right. Yeah. Not, sorry, not feats. Curses. What the hell am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Gotcha. I'll start with Gyasa, since that's something that's obviously going to be unique to this kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Geisha, uh, sorry, yeah, that's uh, just I, I, I hate to like I don't I don't want to like <laughs> go around correcting everybody. Uh, I'll just say it as I know to say it, but mm -hmm. um, Geisha are. Um, they're they're this uh, obviously uh, people might be familiar with them uh, through the the fifth edition spell, uh, which is uh, very much directly inspired from Irish mythology. Uh, as when you again going back to the original myth uh, original mythology, those uh, original sources, as everything in Heroes of Tara does, uh, geisha are these uh, kind of this motif that turn up all over the place. Uh, not only in Irish mythology, but also with different names in, like, Welsh mythology. It seemed to have a pretty wide bearing in Celtic culture in general, mm -hmm. this uh, this belief of uh, idiosyncratic duties or obligations or prohibitions that were placed upon a person by either fate or the gods themselves or some other kind of cosmic duty or uh, expectation. Uh Obviously, in uh, the 5th edition spell, Geish, it's just like, uh, if I recall, the spellcaster gets to kind of lay some demand upon the, the, the target creature. And uh, the target creature has to follow through with the instructions. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it's more of a... More of something inherent to a character that they just... They, they, like I say, they are just bestowed. It is just bestowed upon them by fate or by the gods, and it's often it may, doesn't seem to make any sense. It's often idiosyncratic in many ways. For example, the Kuholan, uh, the hero I referenced earlier, he had a geish that prohibited him from eating dog meat, and uh, he was actually eventually overthrown and uh, defeated by being tricked into eating dog meat. Uh, like as soon as he broke this prohibition, he uh, that that was the end of his lucky streak. You know, he was uh, killed in battle. Mm -hmm. The you know very soon after. Uh, so the way I wanted to express this kind of idea in Heroes of Tara is it's a totally optional aspect that players can elect to uh, take on or not, whether they wish, and. Uh, they roll on a d20 table to randomly select it because this is not something a character is uh, choosing for themselves. This is something that is, you know, bestowed from on high. And this d20 table has uh, a range of, you know, pretty odd things. Like, you know, you're not allowed to sleep indoors. Uh, you're only, you know, you have to uh, wake each morning before the sunrise. Uh you can only speak under the shadow of a tree or a roof or after sundown, not in sunlight. They get pretty weird, some of them. Uh, you know, never refuse the request of a dying person. Or, uh, you know, must always wear a, a dead uh, weasel or crow around your neck at all times. 
And if you break your code of conduct, if you uh, break your uh, prohibition, or if you uh, don't follow what is expected of you by this geish, a curse will befall you. Mm -hmm. But if you follow through with it, uh, here's the incentive as to why a player might want to take it uh, beyond just being a fun little uh, roleplay cue would be uh, that if you follow through with it, and if the geish remains unbroken, your character benefits from uh, an associated passive benefit buff or boon in uh, some appropriate way. Like uh, one geish might provide a bonus in a particular skill, while another might give a few extra temporary hit points, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So it just seemed like a nice little way to kind of, again, through mechanics, you know, get players feeling kind of founded in the the, the, the spirit of the setting, you know? Yeah, I gotcha. Now, when it comes to cur when it comes to curses, and the idea of curses and cursed items and the like have certainly been in the Indian one form or another, but they've ne but but the idea of curses themselves have never gotten the full attention. Right. Yeah, and they've always been pretty insubstantial. They've always been I felt really forgettable. You know, I mean, in 5th edition, it's just like, you know, been whittled down to the spell bestow curse and remove curse you know bestow curse is just like some really pathetic temporary debuff and uh or it might not it might not be temporary it might be permanent but it's pretty here still i was pretty... all this time thinking remove curse was D's version of a divorce attorney <laughs> right but uh yeah so uh I don't even have Bestow Curse in Heroes of Tara. Like, that, that, that particular spell was just so unimpressive that it didn't even really deserve the, the name of Curse to me in many ways. Plus, but, uh, I, get, oh, yeah. I, I get the feeling that you, would, that you would much rather have the idea of getting rid of a curse be something that is an ordeal in and of itself, not something that you just cast a spell and you're done. Absolutely, yeah, that's very much the idea, where... Uh, these, when you befall a curse, when a curse befalls you, rather, in Heroes of Tara, and it can happen many various ways. For instance, the Feely class, they have, uh, they have inherent protection, where you roll a percentile dice if you get hit, and if you come up on a certain result, the one that, person that hit you, they might just get a curse. There are a few other ways that it happens as well, like, for example, breaking a gauge. Uh, but as soon as this curse befalls you, whatever it might be, it's, uh, you, you know, you determine the particular effects on a random roll table. The effects are going to be persistent, they're going to be permanent, and they are not going to be easily uh, ignored. Like, you might get turned to stone, you might get polymorphed into an animal, you might go deaf or blind, you might uh, get a constant fear effect laid upon you, uh, where you are afraid of everything and everyone at all times. Uh so on and so forth. Uh, and if this happens, yeah, it's very much kind of a plot hook where the players will then kind of have to go to some lengths, go on a quest, you know, find the right NPC, find the right uh, MacGuffin item to get that uh, curse removed. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, higher levels, you know, the they'll be able to, you know, take care of it themselves uh, through the application of various abilities or spells, etc. But up until level 10, at the very least. You know, it's it's an actual substantial element of the game's plot, as I feel any proper curse should be. And uh, that's that's not just a feeling, obviously, of uh, how D&D &D curses should operate, but it's also a fairly genuine representation of the function that uh, curses uh, performed in the actual mythology itself. You know, these... Mm -hmm. These sort of things are always happening in the stories. Now, with now, um, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, when it when it comes to when it, when it comes when it comes the other the other thing that I was curious about is in regard to uh, magic items, since for the longest time D and D has had a, has had a bit of it has had a bit of an issue with um. What's been called Monty Hall, um, i.e. GMs who are a little bit too liberal when it comes to magic items and magic items being, in some cases, being a necessity. Whereas oh, yep. when we look when we look at a lot of mythos, um, 
you're not going to you're not going to see a you're not going to see even a high level character um, decked out in magic armor with a magic helmet and a magic weapon and magic boot magic boots and all that they're going to right. have a few specific um, tools that are ma that are magical like say, like say the like say the um, the mirror shield that Perseus had which was right. specifically for dealing with the Medusa um, exactly. Or... Yeah, yeah, and if they are fully decked out, like a lot of those things are probably on loan from some deity or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, or as to use Lord of the Rings as an example, um, um, Bill, um, you had you only had to you at the start at the start you only had a you only had a, a scant handful of magic items given, namely a, one of them one of them doesn't shouldn't even really count that being a chain shirt made of mithril which right mithril itself isn't magical it's just really really tough and really really light and very yeah. rare um right but on the other hand you have the short sword sting that glow that would glow whenever um orcs were nearby yeah which in itself like would seem terribly underwhelming to many D D. But uh, yeah, no. In the in this setting, uh, weapon enchantments and uh, magical items are very much a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not as easily accessed. Obviously, that's up to the D the DM's purview. But you know, as a you know, as far as they would be accessible directly by the players, there are a few class abilities that allow uh, enchanted weapons to come in. For example, uh, I believe by seventh level. Feely are able to uh, spend some of their invocation points, well, a very high amount of their invocation points, in order to enchant weapons. We have a whole list of our own unique weapon enchantments. Uh, Blessed Champions, they get to choose a weapon enchantment at third level for themselves. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, it's just up to what the DM hands out. But uh, obviously the, uh, the, the big feature in Heroes of Tara when it comes to this sort of thing is the head hunting system that we have where basically uh, again uh in interest of uh, simulating uh an authentic aspect of the actual uh source material or historical s uh, material in this case mm -hmm. uh the ancient celtic people were a uh, practiced the uh, head hunting in their warfare it was believed that the uh soul resided in the head and so that made the head this uh, very potent spiritual totem. It gathering the, these uh, trophies weren't wasn't just uh, a matter of uh, prestige and glory for the warrior. It was also a matter of uh, accumulating spiritual potency in a way. And I chose I, I chose to uh, represent that in this game by uh, associating very literal spiritual effects or boons from these heads. Uh, where they actually become kind of the stand-in for wondrous items in this game. Uh, where in basic 5th edition, you would have, you know, the category of magic items known as wondrous items that perform all of these, you know, crazy, cool, novel, specific little functions and doodads and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, or just plain straight passive uh, abilities or buffs or whatnot. That's that's what these uh these trophy heads do. Now I know that sounds perhaps pretty grisly to some people, but there are, there are also alternatives offered within the player's guide if that's not exactly to everyone's taste. Mm -hmm. Now, with with all the, with all that said, now right when it comes to the when it comes to the pl the uh, player's guide, um. What are you shooting for as far as a as far as a total page count, especially, which I realize might be a bit tricky to say given all of the um, given all these stretch goals. Yeah, and I, we're we're certainly knocking down a good few of those stretch goals, so it's mm -hmm. difficult to say where we'll wind up. But uh, it's a uh, it's certainly not a bad problem to have at this point. Mm -hmm. But uh. Well, right now, going off of the uh, demo PDF, that is about 240, 239 pages, uh, 39 or 40. And that's already quite substantial, but that is with a very minimal uh, 
layout work or illustrations added in. So once you start thinking about illustrations and layout work being added in, uh, that increases this substantially. I mean, I, I hesitate to imagine that it would necessarily double the page count, but it would certainly bring it up there. Uh, and then, of course, we got to anticipate our, you know, the editors. They haven't had a crack at this yet, mm -hmm. so they'll very likely be trimming the fat in quite a few places. I'd say, you know, we, we could very safely shoot for that good average golden mean of, you know, uh, 300, 320 pages. A fairly typical size for uh, a full-size player's handbook. Mm -hmm. Well, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Currently on our Kickstarter page, uh, we are stating our uh, date of publication as February of 2022. Uh, after we conclude the ongoing Kickstarter campaign, uh, we will obviously be going into quite a few months of production. Mm -hmm. uh, the final deadline that I am uh, going to be extending to contractors, such as editors and illustrators, will be uh, January 1st. At least that's the theoretical deadline that we're working with right now. It might have to be made, obviously. Uh, but after that, after we get all of our things in, we obviously then just hand it on down to the uh, layout artist to do their thing. And so, yeah, we're, we're hoping that uh, February 2022 uh, and as of right now, I'm willing to stand by that uh, by that objective. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how that develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up, come all the way over to the show to the show and enjoy the particular brand of madness that comes around here. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for allowing me to just uh, blather on and ramble uh, within your temple here. Mm -hmm. It's been a very welcoming place. Yeah, we t we t we um, like I said, we pl we plan to have no plan. <laughs> Fair enough. But that's very wise of you. Anytime you see fit to return, whether whether it's to whether it's to further discuss here. Heroes of Tara, or ju or just to sh or just to shit post why and why um anyone who anyone who plays lawful stupid should probably should probably be keel hauled. Yeah. <laughs> um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I would certainly look forward to next time, Mildred. Again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!